Uh, we, we're going to invite uh, uh, Dan and uh, also uh, Jody, our uh, third panelist. Uh, uh, Jody Kang is a chief consumer officer for Fresh Direct. She's responsible for all consumer revenue, uh, mobile web, e-commerce experience, and uh, we actually uh, originally on the panel uh, have the chief agriculture officer from Mars. And uh, he, uh, his uh, flight got canceled in, uh, in uh, Nairobi. Uh, happens sometimes in Africa. So, uh, they, they, but, but uh, we have uh, really, uh, Ju uh, Dan, please. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, let me see, why don't you switch? Yeah, so, um, you know, you see a panel, you, you expect argument between the panelists, right? So we're, that's not what we're doing here. You know, the reason we're doing, uh, not only to listen to this uh, uh, great speakers a little bit more, the thought leaders, and then hear from, uh, from a fresh concept expert of one of the most successful uh, examples in recent years, but we're, we're doing this so that you can have a idea of what's happening in our food accelerator. You know, we have uh, at least twice a week what we call mentor sessions. Actually, a few of other mentors in the audience, uh, Joe Berg, the, 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 the hunger expert, and uh, uh, Daniel Gold, uh, Food Plus Tech, and uh, uh, our, our Italian partner, Italian partner from uh, uh, Bologna, uh, Italy, the Yukon Group, Andrea. And, and so, so, uh, so you're, you're going to uh, witness this uh, public mentor session where our cohort companies is going to ask a few questions, and uh, we want to hear from, from all of you. So uh, who wants to start? Maybe, uh, OK, Green Blender. Hello. I'm Amir from Green Blender. I have a question for you guys. Uh, so the f source of our food is often a mystery. What can farmers, distributors, policymakers, and consumers do to tra strengthen transparency and food traceability? I'll go first. Yeah. <laughs> Easy question. Um, so at Fresh Direct, one of the things that we immediately learned, I've been at the company just about a year, is that the company grew up as a supply chain and logistics company that has really perfected what they do in that um, aspect. And really at the core of the business, the reason for being is to get great fresh food to people with less friction, get it easier. So a lot of you have the same goals. And we send trucks seven days a week out to farmers um, to pick up their harvest. And we hold it one day in our warehouse, and it goes to consumers' houses the next day. But one of the key things that you did bring up is how do consumers access this information? The number one, we did a lot of research that I said to Shen Tong and to Nikki that I would share this year on what, what are consumers' issues around food and consumption and shopping. Number one thing is the source of their food. So when you, go, when you shop online, one of the great things that you can do is if you have a nut allergy or if you've got um, other dietetic preferences, technology's evolved to the place where you can have that looking at the labels online. To this point of you can't manage your disease. So much of the population doesn't have access or doesn't shop this way. You cannot manage a disease. And I see you shaking. If your kid is sick, you can't go to every aisle. We cannot see the labels. So the first thing is that we need to help consumers with that. We have a great interest in that. The second thing is really helping you set it. And when you set it about Chipotle with the ingredients and, and talking about the farmers, we need to help the farmers have a direct connection with consumers. So we need to have the, give the farmers the tools so they can talk about what their, um, what their philosophy is and how their um, food is grown because that is what people want to know. And so I think for us, at that moment of purchase, we're going to help you make the best decision. We're not telling you how to eat, but we're going to give you the tools. But we need them to help us do that. Any thoughts on transparency from Michael or Dan? Or, uh, let's well, the flip side of that is that there's so much in the grocery store that, 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 that is purposely sort of hiding ingredients. I mean, not just like the 5,000 chemicals that are used as processing aids. I, I wrote the first story that, that, that identified the term pink slime for that meat additive extender um, coined by a USDA scientist, actually, in trying to describe the texture of this material. But, but even, you know, for, and I think it still hasn't changed much, the, the, it was described, you wouldn't see it on the label. You couldn't, even if you, if you wanted not to eat a hamburger product that didn't have that particular ingredient in it, 
you had you were out of luck because it was described as simply as as beef on the ingredient list and so there are these continuing big battles in the store just for basic identification of things that people think are important maybe we we'll take another question uh, yeah Dwayne Dahl with Agrilicious. Uh, looking forward, I'm curious to get your thoughts on how aggressive you think the food giants are going to be in acquiring uh, organic food companies. And then secondly, uh, what do you think the impact of that is? Mm. Yeah. No. So, I mean, I think they already are, and, I, 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 and, and you, may, you may have a, a bigger list on that. Um, the, um, and the in you know, the impact is a really, you know, that's a really good question. Because so part of me wants to hope that it's going to be good for everybody. They're going to infuse money in an industry. But you do have to remember that organic has a very narrow definition. And a lot of people equate organic with healthier in lots of ways besides having less pesticide, um, local, um, you know, natural and sort of other senses like that. So. I think that we're starting to see a number of, you know, health washing products out there that have the big organic sticker on the front, but when you turn it over and look at the fine print, it has just as much of the bad boy ingredients that um, that somebody managing their weight or other health issues are, are yeah. concerned about. But 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 um, yeah, I think that the same thing. What we're seeing is that dialogue and that kind of uh, veneer is out there. Um, but when they actually come together, those conversations on scale and um, really growing this, whether it's cooperative, I think what we're seeing is much more of a cooperative networks. And whether or not that is funded through financial world or um, the big food companies. But it is about scale. I see Vanessa. Hi, my name is Vanessa, and I'm with Greenies. In my research, I found that about 30 to 40 percent of restaurants really are trying to buy local. What if all of a sudden, how much of a difference do you think it would, it would make if, say, 60 to 80 percent of restaurants started buying local? How would this impact farms? Do you think it would help them or it would hurt them? Uh, where? Yeah, where? Here? Or? I guess let's start with the East Coast, yeah. this region. I mean, it, we're, the, the market here is oversaturated. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a story that I don't know has been told. So completely, but but the the amount of farmers markets has increased two thousand percent, I think, in the last ten years. Uh, the number of people going to the number of restaurants, uh, and so the question now, although it's always of demand, but it's much more, I think, of, of supply. And then when you talk about restaurants, you're talking about wholesale accounts. So ten years ago, you know, farmers were really interested in restaurants; they bought in bulk and could pass off the wholesale cost, the, 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 uh, the amount of money that they're making off of wholesale, they could justify that because of the, the amounts that restaurants were buying, especially if they were consistent customers. Now it's a very different relationship because there's enough people, there's enough demand here at the Union Square Green Market where farmers really don't have to sell the restaurants. Of course, I'm making a very sweeping statement. There's some, some vegetables and grains that really do rely on restaurant accounts. For the most part, uh, you have the demand. Why would you sell wholesale when you can sell retail? Uh, and that's become, a, that's become a big problem. Uh, so my, you know, this is a very, un, you know, very sort of personal response to this, is that what I'm seeing is that we're entering into a new phase of this farm to table movement where the supply is, where, where where the recent history is that if you're a small farmer selling directly at a farmer's market, you're, you're living the dream the last 10 mm -hmm. years. You're, you are in the boom times. Mm -hmm. And this, the heartstring says, well, we've got to support the small farmer. Actually, small farmer hasn't done this well in a long time. We talk a lot about the industrial food system. And it's also uh, there's a, one of the most constant questions I struggle for a long time is, is actually behavioral change in the eaters. right? But, but I'll leave the chance for another question from cohort. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, my name is Josh Cook. I'm from Next Organics. Uh, this kind of question is touching on that. Uh, what do you feel it would take to convince the average consumer to change their eating and food buying habits? This might touch on the psychology of food a little bit, maybe. I actually have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I mean, it, it's just so. I mean, it's a similar question to that. 
did, and uh, again, I learned from my, my kids. And uh, uh, I, I always assume that, that my wife and I, that if we stop them eating sugar, it's just going to be one of those things we put our feet down and, you know, they're just, we're going to be Chinese Nazi about it. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, the, thing, the interesting thing is that uh, when we go to uh, uh, really interesting uh, 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 restaurants or, or going to a friend's farm to cook, they eat a lot more than they normally would uh, at home or certainly at school. And uh, so gradually it got down to me that maybe they still have a sweeter teeth than adults, uh, maybe not. And this whole savory taste seems to be fairly straightforward. So I eventually figured out the single, single answer because you, know, you stumble about behavior change in a way, you know. It's actually uh, pretty simple. What it takes to change the behavior of, uh, of an eater to eat good food, just one bite. I mean, that's my answer. I mean, that's uh, the actual experiences. From my, so my kids, uh, growing up in New York, they go to Halloween, they get lots of candy, and they, 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 they know those candies are to make a ginger, gingerbread house. They actually don't eat the candies. Mm -hmm. So anyway, what do you think? I mean, for me, it goes back to education. It goes back to not, you know, yes, the food pyramid, but actually just having the information and having everybody in this room and this industry just talking about health. And it is taste. But knowing that the actual statistics say, unbelievably, people want to know um, the source of the food they're putting in their body. They want more control. And this is all over the country. And they, they have issues feeding their family. One of the things people um, fight with is variety. Mm. If you talk to young families, the thing that you hear the most, and I see you shaking your head, is you hear, I have too many pallets to feed. I don't know how to keep it healthy across. Um, the way, but if we make it, if we as an industry make it easier, so many people have solutions here, that's going to be an answer. It's interesting when you look at the research, all of those things came up ahead of time and budget. We want to be healthier, but it's what you and your book say, you know, mm. the basic big movements in society do not make it easy for us. And maybe education with a little twist, though, too, because, I mean, like, you know, I, I give talks to universities. One of my favorites was going to one of the oldest black colleges in, in North Carolina, Greensboro, where the Greensboro old four or five and, you know, sat down at the lunch counter. Woolworth, there's a huge history of sort of civil disobedience in the town. And the kids went nuts with the book because to them, and they did these art projects where they, where they drew and sculpted their favorite icons in the grocery store showing what was really inside them that was luring them to them. It was fascinating artwork that they were doing. But as they explained to me, you know, what really captivated them about this wasn't kind of that health stuff, and you couldn't really preach to them about the nutrition, but what they got was this was the man in their lives trying to get them to do his bidding in the same way that he sold cigarettes or alcohol, and they can see processed food in that kind of political framework that will even get a high schooler excited, much less sort of a younger kid. And that's the, that's the kind of home economics uh, curriculum I could sort of envision for today's kids who can't be preached to. Can I, just, I, put, I, put, yeah. I would put my money with chefs. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, that, that, yeah that, that kale revolution happened because of chefs. Uh, Grass-fed beef has happened because of chefs. Uh, Greek yogurt happened because of chefs. I mean, I think a lot of this is trickle so down, you. trickle down, uh, yes. trickle down. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, for uh, it sounds very Republican, trickle down. I don't mean it that way. I mean it in the sense of, like, you know, this starts with more and more, for better or worse, chefs are these cultural icons and, and, and we curate this stuff and, and we pursue flavor. And as you said to me during that dinner, people trust chefs. And because our pursuit group, is for actually, great flavor. And so to, trust to, to, yeah. yeah, right, only group trust, right. And so, so to, to have that bleed into the culture is something not worth underestimating anyway. Yeah, we'll leave the I big would just, last I would just say one thing, Joey. there are researchers at USC that are doing unbelievable research dealing with food pantries around the United States. And one of the things that they say is in the endeavor to get the you know, broad population eating healthier is people don't know what to do if they get a gigantic ton of zucchinis in, they, the broader population doesn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. So in the pantry lines, they've come up with a way 
to give zucchini rest, um, um, recipes mm -hmm. because they found that if not, they were going home and they were frying it with butter and layering it with salt. <laughs> and they um, were connecting with the, the parents, the, the women, um, through the kids. If there was a 14-year-old in the house, they, they enabled them to set up their own recipes on this on their phone. And so, I mean, there are ways that we can do this, and one good experience leads to the next one. With that, thank you for the panel. Thank you very much.